Welcome to the PBN Podcast, Alicia. Really great to meet you and have you on the show. Thank you, Rob, so much for having me. It's a pleasure to meet you. So before we get started, I always love to ask my guests this first question, which is how did you discover the vegan or plant-based lifestyle? Where did it all begin for you? I wrote a book called The Kind Diet, and I sort of broke it down into how it all evolved for me because it really started uh, when I was in England with my mom and my family and we heard, you know, we heard these animals crying. I heard, we were in the country and I heard crying and crying. And I think I asked the farmers, what is this sound? Or someone, you know, walking by in the countryside of England. And I remember being told by my mom and them that it was the babies being taken away from their mothers. And this was, a, you know, when you're eight years old, at that point, you just think that animals are you don't know that animals are food. You you just think of them as your friends. And so this was a horrifying concept. And then as we were fl flying home on the plane, my brother and I were sitting next to each other and we were eating pork chops. I think it was either pork chops or lamb, one or the other. No, it was lamb. It was lamb because then he started making the sounds of the lamb to torment me as brothers do. And this really sealed the deal. Like, I had no idea that lamb was lamb, you know, or that chicken was chicken. I don't think any kids think about it like that. And so I just, I declared I was going vegetarian and, uh, but I had no one in my life who was vegetarian. I had no information about how to be vegetarian and I was eight years old for God's sakes. So my idea of being vegetarian at the time was sort of, I'll just eat ice cream and French fries and, you know, potatoes and, and call it a day. That didn't last for long. So I, I, from eight to about 21, I call myself what a, a flirt because I knew that intuitive, I knew I couldn't, I knew I didn't want to hurt animals, but I wasn't equipped yet to know how to do this. And so I just, and I was selfish. I kept giving in to the yummy looking steak in front of me or whatever it was that was in front of me. I would just go, cause I loved the taste of all of that. I grew up on all of it. So it wasn't until I rescued this dog, Samson, who was my, basically my boyfriend. I mean, we slept together. We made out basically. And, you know, he slept in my bed and I loved this dog so much. I mean, I grieved his loss for six months after he passed, but anyway, he was my buddy. And so it occurred to me when I was rubbing his legs that why wouldn't my leg taste just as good as his leg? Or why wouldn't his leg take just as good as the pig's leg? And sort of, I started to put together, why are we making one animal our boyfriend and the other animal, you know? Up neck. Yeah. So so many people love their dogs and they don't, they, they don't think about, well, what's the difference? So anyway, I, I finally saw a documentary and I went to animal rights conference 2000. I think I was already vegan by the time I went there. But prior to that, I saw a documentary that just blew my mind. And it just started to make me get that, you know, and the, and the final thing was I had a meeting with PETA because I was an animal activist since I was a little girl. I was trying to stop my boyfriend from stepping on beetles at school, or I was trying to rescue dogs with my mom on the street. And running on freeways, very unsafe. We would run on the freeway to try and stop these, to help these animals. So, you know, I was, I had all that in my, in my bones and because of my mom, my mom loved animals so much, but what I didn't understand was the food connection. And, um, and so finally I was at a meeting with PETA. I think I was 21 years old and I was talking to them about all the different campaigns that we were working on anti-dissection and, you know, say no, you know, animal, t animal testing and things like that and no fur. And I was working on all these campaigns with them, but I was still eating animals. I had steaks in my refrigerator at this time. Wow. And, uh, and so when I sat with them, I was that animal lover who ate animals, you know, all those people. The cognitive dissonance, right? Yeah. And so I just went home from that meeting. I remember being like, well, what are you doing about this? Because they told me all these awful stories about the pigs and I wanted to save the pigs. And I realized- Was that with Ingrid Newkirk? Did you no, meet Ingrid? It was Dave Math um, D Dan Matthews and uh, Lisa L L Lange. Yes. Lisa and I you know, have been working together ever since, forever. Uh, she's my go-to girl. I call her to ask her about things that are in scripts that I don't like, or, you know, is this okay? Or how do we feel about this? And should I say no to this? You know, that kind of thing. But, um, 
But ultimately that meeting, I went home and I just realized in the car that I was a hypocrite, a really big hypocrite. I loved animals. I wanted them to fix everything and I wasn't willing to do the work myself. And, uh, so, and it was because of temptation. Usually I'd say I was vegetarian and then I would see my friend eating something. I'd be like, can I have a bite? So, um, so anyway, that day I made the choice. I just said, I can't do this. I can't look at myself in the mirror anymore and say, you're an animal lover and you're a kind person and can keep contributing to the suffering. And uh, I told my boyfriend at the time, who then became my husband, who is now my father, my, the father of my son, um, you know, that he, that I wanted to be vegetarian and he, the vegan, actually, I was going cold turkey. And he said, I'll do it with you. And so we, we started that journey then. Amazing. Well, I mean, honestly, at such a young age to be able to, as I often talk about, unlocking of a realization within you, which you knew intrinsically, you knew the truth, you knew what was going on. And when you had that connection, you, I suppose when you were in those meetings with those passionate animal rights activists and they were showing you these films, I was quite interested. What were, You said you watched a film. What was the film you watched that? Well, I, you know, I didn't see the film with Lisa and Dan. They were very, you know... PETA always gets this reputation of being so whatever, but they were Intense. so loving and kind with me. They yeah. never tried to turn me. I mean, honestly, they were just leading by example. They were eating beautiful, delicious food in front of me. And I was feeling like I ordered the PC thing, but my thing wasn't vegan. It wasn't meat, but it was not vegan. And I just thought, well, theirs looks just as good. And um, so – so I started to make that connection. And the movie that I saw later that really messed me up was The Witness. Do you know The Witness? It was made by Tribe of Heart. And I saw it at the Animal Rights Confer Conference in 2000. And I can't remember if that was the first documentary I saw, but it was, <gasps> I mean, it's a great story because it's this man who doesn't like animals at all. He has no interest in animals, but he falls in love with this, or he has a crush on this girl and he wants to date her. And yes, she, I know the story. You know what I'm talking about. So, I, I, I remember it now. Yeah. So it's a great story. and But it's also very powerful and it really messed with me. I mean, I, I come out of those movies sobbing hysterically. Not like a mild, oh, that's sad. Like, <laughs> I love the bit where he talks about, is it the cat? He's, he's touching his cat's leg as well. And he's feeling the connection. So many people I've interviewed over the years have the same connection. And isn't it so beautiful that you have a dog or a cat or a duck or, a, or something in your life, an animal, a companion animal, and you are caring for them and showing that love. And then that realization that you sort of feel their leg and you think this is no different to the pork chop or the la you know, the, the, the um, lamb or anything that I'm eating, there's bone, there's flesh. Um, and that realization happens. And I think, you know, that's what when people call about making the connection, yes. making that connection between seeing a piece of meat on your plate that is not an individual it's just a piece of flesh to seeing a living breathing feeling animal and i think that's when we really step into the kind of life right to, to yeah. use the name of your book as we step into that life and that realization that kindness can begin on our plate um and you know going from there obviously you made these changes i'd love to hear a bit about do you remember like how things changed for you physically when you moved to become vegan because i assume before you were eating cheese and dairy and yogurt and things like that um did you notice any changes in yourself in the beginning massive i mean so i i remember it was about three weeks in that people started to comment that I seemed like I was glowing. And that was quite nice. <laughs> I was like, what? But I also remember how I felt. I felt like I was walking taller because I was standing in my truth. And I felt, you know, that I had released a lot of gunk. I mean, there was a lot more gunk to get out later, but, but I had released a lot of gunk at that point. So I felt this sort of lighter feeling. I was walking through the world in a lighter state Standing in my truth felt very powerful as a female, or I suppose anyone. We all struggle with self-worth and um, being kind to ourselves. And I didn't have a lot of any of that stuff. So when I made that choice, I felt a sort of sense of security. I'm standing for myself. I'm standing in my beliefs. This is powerful. I'm saying no. It's sort of saying no to the thing you don't believe in is an act of standing for yourself an act of defiance in a society that demands we conform right yes and so that was a powerful thing for me um to recognize kind of like you know if you're a female it's hard for women to say no to men sometimes right if you don't have 
a ton of strength. It's that's a complicated thing, no matter what. Even if you are strong, it's hard. And I think when you, um, it felt very powerful for me to say no. I'm not doing this. This is not going to happen anymore. And it just, it, it really helped me to grow into myself. And then I also, you know, I was on an asthma inhaler all every day and I had allergy shots twice a week. All of that went away. I stopped taking antibiotics. I used to take antibiotics about twice a year because I'd get bronchitis all the time. And, um, and I had cystic acne and I was getting a little bit chubbier at that time. And I, um, and people were saying mean things to me about me, about me in the press. And, um, so all of those things just shifted. The whites of my eyes got really white. I slimmed up. My acne went away. My nails got so strong. I couldn't bend them. My eyes got white. I just, my hair was so strong and thick and I just, everything changed. So I didn't have something. I was young enough that I didn't have, you know, cancer or heart disease or anything like that or diabetes, but I was sure on my way, just like everyone else is. So um, I I definitely nipped it all in the butt before. It's amazing you did it at such a young age as well, because as you say, you know, growing up, you grew up in the US, right? So the the sad diet or the the, the, the standard American diet, which does actually make you sad, ironically, uh, eating, eating all these very heavily processed foods. Um, but obviously, you know, part of your journey has been to to create a vegan cookbook to, you know, kind of, you know, inspire people and you call it, you know, the kind, you call the lifestyle, the kind life. I'd love to hear a bit more about this sort of philosophy and using kindness as a kind of call to arms really about how we can change our lives, not just on the outside, but on the inside as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I saw the way that books, you know, the books that I was interested in that, you know, Ocean Rob, I mean, not Ocean Robin, sorry, John Robbins books and, um, Dr. Neil Bernard's books, they're filled with wonderful information, but it's, you have to be a certain kind of person who's interested enough to engage in that kind of book because they're dry. You know, they're books about academia, they're academia. very specific. Yeah. And, uh, and so you have to be either wanting to change your life or, you know, you have to have a very strong commitment to that. And we know that our culture is moving so fast and people have no attention span. And I just wanted to reach an Oprah audience. I wanted to reach anyone who had wanted to feel good and look good and kind of, you know, seduce them through that, knowing that, because the truth is what I found on my journey was that all the things, all the, like no cream is going to make you pretty. No, you know, all these things that people spend so much money and time on doing um, are not the answers to their happiness, their health, their beauty, all of the secrets are in your food, period. It's where everything lies. So, you know, people are getting older, but when you age, you don't have to fall apart. We assume the common, if you if you go to your high school reunion, everyone is falling apart. And that is what you expect because they were 40 and now they're supposed to start falling apart. But what I was experiencing is that I was getting stronger and healthier with time. And so I really, of course, there are aging things that are real that do happen, but in general, everything was just getting stronger and better and healthier. And I had I had the access and secret to this, to how to be responsible for my well-being and to feel good and to make control my moods based on the food I was eating, that I could see that if I ate naughty foods, it made me not feel good. And then my mood would drop, right? So I just saw it as this secret. And as I went along, I changed, I got even more specific about it. And I, I fell into kind of macrobiotic eating more basically just eating real food, whole grains, plant-based. <laughs> yes. Plant-based whole real foods. And, um, that shifted things even more for me. And I found how to use food as literally medicine, the way that Hippocrates and if I will say Jesus intended. So, um, <laughs> they say, I don't know if Jesus really was but they say Jesus. I, I definitely feel if Jesus was alive today, he'd be vegan. He'd be vegan the, for sure. 
compassionate man that he was yeah. teaching loving kindness. And I, I also think that about the Buddha as well and any other religious man. And we can, we, will, we can talk a bit about spirituality in a bit as well. But, you know, isn't it interesting how people change uh, when they change their diet, you know, not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually, as you spoke about feeling lighter, this glow, we are what we eat. And I think when people say that, I don't think the true magnitude of that gets through to people. The food that we put in our mouth, our body, through all the magic of biology, builds it, tears it apart, and turns it into every cell and fiber of our being. So just, you know, when you really think about it, if you're going to eat bad foods, heavily processed foods, you are literally using that food to build your body. And Dr. Greger has something which he which makes me laugh when he says, when you eat unhealthy foods, it's a bit like hitting yourself with a hammer. You're causing some kind of damage. If you eat a little unhealthy food, it's just a smaller hammer, but you're still hitting yourself with a hammer. <laughs> So, you know, we want to nourish ourselves. And, you know, I love that your book was in the New York Times bestseller list for 20 weeks. So it just shows how um, kind of receptive people were to what you put in then. How did it feel having something that you created, uh, you know, with your love and, and compassion, putting it into the world? How did it feel kind of putting that out there and it doing so well? I want to say so much because uh, going back to the hammer thing, you know, in the kind diet, what I think I did differently and why I put, why I think the book works so well was because it was not dry. It was, I was, I was trying to make it fun and really, you know, I wanted it to be the book that I wanted to read because the, uh, there was some books that had ma have made a lot of good progress for people, but they were so specific to kind of a young, naughty, sassy group. And I felt like I can't give that to my mother. I can't give that to, you know, I want the book that I can give to everyone. The book that is going to satisfy the intellectual because it's got all the Harvard studies and all of the sightings, but be palatable, you know, enjoyable enough to read that you feel like you're talking to a friend and really promise you your healthiest, best self that also just happens to save our planet and help animals. But but let's just focus on you. Let's just make it all about you and your wellness and your beauty. So I was really trying to seduce that way. And I think it helped a lot of people because that's how they got in going, I want to be kind to myself. I want to be kind to the earth. I want to be kind to animals. And I can do that all in one go. And I also had a cheeky thing about kind because you know how in Rasta you say the kind when you're talking about marijuana. I thought it was funny that it's like, this is the kind, the kind. But that was my own little secret inside joke of sort of this, this life, this is the magic. This is the chronic kind stuff. This is the stuff that's going to make you... Um, and I don't mean that I'm advocating for marijuana at all. I, I just mean that in my past, I had we'd always people would say, "This is the kind, man. This is the kind." And so I was like, "Yes, this is the kind. This is the golden ticket to the best life you could have." And so, how did it feel to have it received? I mean, to have Oprah have me on her show and tell me that she loved my recipes and be so interested in it—it it made me so happy. And to have, you know. When people stop me and tell me I read your book and it changed my life, nothing in this, nothing, no movie somebody could tell me they saw, nothing is going to do it for me the way that does. You know that um, that I can. Some I wrote the Kind Mama too, and to help women get pregnant and have healthy babies and to have choices about how they go about things and to do things naturally and to consider things naturally and um, giving them all the stats on what happens with birth and so that they can make good decisions for themselves. And when women stop me and they say, you know, I couldn't get pregnant, but then I read the Kai Mama and I, I, you know, I raised my baby the way that you outlined and it's just, I cannot thank you much. And one woman was crying. I mean, she was just, and, and nothing, there's just nothing that, that can top that. So I'm so happy. I'm so happy when I, I would go to book signings and from when I had a hardback and the, from the original soft, soft copy release, they, people would come and say, since I got your book last time, I, um, I've gotten off all my medications. My doctor gave me a sign of 
like I have no more this, no more that. People were solving their lupus. People were solving their heart disease. People were um, losing a hundred pounds. And 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 when you talk about the hammer, it made me think because I do advocate a little play. You know, I do hammer myself a teeny bit here and there, and it depends on what you consider a hammer. You know, I don't. I know that if I eat. Um, you know, too much salt or, you know, like too much restaurant food, it's not going to make me feel good. But if I eat restaurant food and then eat a really healthy meal that I make myself the next meal, I can balance that out. Right. And I can still play and have fun because I'm a foodie. And that was the other thing I really wanted to bring to the kind life was I think at the time people were to the kind diet, people really think lentils and tofu and like, you know, granola and granola is great, by the way. Uh, but all but when, when we think, you know, it's not about a block of plain tofu. That's disgusting. I don't want to eat a block of plain tofu, but what you can do with tofu. And I think, um, you know, same with just pretty much all of it. I wanted people to understand. And I think since then, so many chefs have become making vegan food for people and people are understanding that this is, you are not sacrificing taste. There's no taste sacrifice. There's no satisfaction issue. You're not, you're, there's no deprivation. This is about indulging and enjoying, but there's two different avenues that you can pick for me. You can choose the ethical approach that makes you healthier than your, your counterparts, but, but maybe isn't designed for your ultimate health. It's good. It's better for you. That's going vegan. But if you really want to feel amazing all the time, and you really want to clean yourself out and be your bestest, bestest self, then it's about choosing foods that are healing most of the time and playing a little less, you know? Mm, absolutely. And it's, you know, I always say to people, health is a choice when it comes to how we live our lives. Because as you say, we should never feel pressured and kind of beholden to the opinions of others about what we eat and how we eat. Because ultimately, you know, our bodies are our own. Uh, our, you know, we're coming into a world now where body autonomy and kind of the focus on who we are as people and as individuals is becoming more and more important. So taking our own health into our own hands has never been more important now in, in today's world, especially with the likes of sort of pharmaceutical markets. Marketing. I spent some time in the US and I grew up in Zimbabwe in Africa. I just um, realized and- you're South African. I realized you're yes. not English. I just, five, <laughs> before you said that, I went, he's South African. He's not English. Yeah, so I grew up in between South Africa and Zimbabwe. But, you know, when I came to the US, I'd never experienced anything like the uh, the world of advertising and media um and and i you know for most of my career i've been in tv and advertising media tv advertising digital advertising you know selling stuff to people and uh, you know i had an epiphany a few years ago and i stepped away from that world because i realized i wanted to help people i wanted to use my skills to make the world a better place which hopefully is what i'm doing with plant-based news but our kind of focus really is kind of is just to awaken people to the true potential of of uh, ourselves as people and that often starts with our diet but when it comes to being vegan obviously back in when you were in your 20s when you went vegan you know it's not always been um a a lifestyle that people have been open to there's been a lot of aggressive and this continues to be a lot of aggressive negativity towards us as people um a lot of slander a lot of misinformation uh you know there's a lot of tropes about the angry vegan you know vegans thrusting their opinions but obviously being in the public eye and making movies and being you know a, a person who's who's put themselves out there in the world by being in the public eye and being a celebrity. How did the media attention affect you and your choice to become vegan? Did you get a lot of uh, kickback from it? Did you experience any kind of negativity in the early days? I just thought of like three stories I want to say at the same time. (laughs) One I'll hold for a second, which is about how you, the, the angry vegan and how you don't even have to say a word. So we'll put that one over here for a second if we want to go back to it, but um, because it's funny. But in terms of getting negative, um, you know, I think that I was, you know, I, I was, I didn't know how to do it gracefully at first, for sure. I was sort of ran around going, fire, 
rape, <laughs> because that's what's happening. I mean, like, I don't know. That's the truth. It's like, do you know what's happening? Do you know what's happening? Do you know what's happening? I would just, I mean, I remember my husband would say, you know, could you just go to a party and talk about something else maybe? And I was like, well, what, nothing else is more important. So, you know, I could see how, you know, I would go on a talk show and I'd start talking. They'd ask me a question about they asked me a question about a, a famous actress, a musician, and I started talking about anal, anal electrocution of the animals, which is not morning talk show, you know, conversation when you're on there to promote a fun movie. You know what I mean? So, and I remember going to other countries, England and other places to do um, press junkets. And I was just very intense and very serious and any opportunity to tell them about what was going on I would take it because I certainly didn't like being famous at all. I didn't respond to it well. And so I just thought, well, I'm, if you're going to, if I have to sit here and do this interview, I'm just going to tell you what I want to tell you about. <laughs> so it was a little bit um, not helpful, you know, because while I thought I was helping, I thought that I was getting the message out there. I can see how it just turned people off. They just, and it was very easy for them to write me off and say mean things. And, um, and uh, hopefully I reached some people too. Hopefully it wasn't all in, in vain. But what I found over time, I think Howard Lyman talked about it a lot at the Animal Rights Conference, was, um, you know, and I also witnessed it watching other activists, watching other organizations and going, that just seems a bit silly. That doesn't seem helpful, you know? And, um, and so I think over time, I mean, even within the animal rights community, I got, I gave a speech one time talking about how we should do things in a more kind way, potentially. And they all booed me off the stage and had to take me, I had got taken into a room to be with the main people at the event because the people in the audience were pissed. Some of them, it was a specific group that was very upset right. for what I was saying. So even within the animal rights movement, you could get in trouble. And I thought this was really stupid of them because if I wasn't so committed, I could have dropped out. I could have been terrified because it was scary. I could have, you know, but, but luckily they have a true believer here. Like I'm on board. They can't, they can't shake me, but I mean, you get most actresses to show up to a thing and you boo them off. They're going to be like, I'm out. I don't want to do deal with people. So there is, you know, I think, I think I learned over time that the only way to make change is to make it look desirable, right? To, right. I meant to that. To be a poster child for health so people want to know why you look and feel so happy and well and to um and to 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 not go around I also was spending so much energy trying to convince those who are not interested and I found that's not helpful either. What would be so much better and I learned this through other, you know, like other activists and watching people do it. And just my experience was that when I just kept to myself and didn't exude any energy around it, which was kind of a relief, which is why I wrote the book so that I didn't have to talk about it anymore. It's like, Oh, you're interested. Read that. And, um, but I found that people would come to when they want to know something, they're actually going to come to you and they're going to ask you from a real, and you can tell the difference between if they're just taunting you because you get a lot of taunting versus they are actually really interested and the interested I can talk to. Then it's, then you have a chance to actually turn someone or help them. But, you know, going around just sort of, I, I'd rather just live by example at this point. I'd rather just I'm going to keep making these changes. I'm going to keep living the way I do. If you're around me and you think it looks appealing, great. If you don't, and I'm going to keep speaking about it, but I'm not going to go to a dinner party and try. So to my dinner party story, I went to, I went to, a, I went to a dinner with a bunch of famous actresses. It was for one of the girl's birthdays. And I won't name any of the names because it's embarrassing. Um, but I'm sitting there and I have not said a word not a word, not, I haven't, I haven't said anything about what I'm ordering, about being vegan, about anything, but just my presence. They all started freaking out. Everyone at the table was getting defensive, insecure, arguing about what they were going to order, defending themselves to me. It was like, as if I had stood up and told them they were all assholes, but I couldn't, I had just, I just sat there and was just part of this dinner. And then everyone's telling me, 
you know, and some people were, one of these actresses was arguing with me about how her diet was all meat and all dairy. And like, that's how you, that's how you be healthy and cleanse. I was just like, okay. But what I learned was sometimes just sitting there gets people activated. So, so I think that people, that some people are um, do, doing things in a way that are not helpful to, to our per- overall perception, but maybe we have to have those people. But also I think it's just people's insecurity inside. They know intuitively that it's not right. They want to continue to do the things that they do with um, permission and your presence alone can activate them. And it's got very little to do with you. So I, um, I, I do try to keep that stuff. I just, it's less energy exuded to go around trying to convince people who don't want to be convinced. So it's such a common story, Alicia. So many times I've heard people say how just the mere presence of themselves at a din- dinner table with friends or family, and I've experienced this myself, and you get this visceral reaction from people because almost by just being there as a vegan, they know what vegans are and what we stand for. It re- it brings this reaction and draws out the truth. And just kind of, you know, taking the, the step back a bit and kind of going back in time, you know, you obviously touch very lightly there on like your feeling about fame and about being famous. Mental health and sort of our mind and how we treat our minds is a big part of our well-being, often heavily neglected, and it affects people in really, really terrible ways, particularly in show business. There's huge amounts of pressure to be this or that or huge expectation on people, particularly women in showbiz. It's just so much pressure to be and look in a certain way. How did that experience affect you and how were you able to maintain your resilience? And I'm hoping part of it was your diet. And, you know, what are some of the things in talking about healing? And we're going to get onto your your amazing new podcast. But what were some of the things you used to be able to sort of maintain your, your positive mental well wellness throughout all of those times? Well, I do think it was my deep connection, you know, I once to truth. So once I knew the truth of how animals are raised for food and how those animals affect our bodies and how those animal foods are destroying the planet, like once you understand all of that, it's, I think, really hard to come away from. And so that um, I was so dedicated and inspired. And so I'm not sh- I, I'm not sure if I entirely understood your question, but I, I think that in general, I've just, my commitment to that has kept me very sane because I'm, I've never, it's, it's, a, it's just as, imp- it's more important maybe than my career. And it's, and I, and I let it become much more important than my career for a long time. And then I had to remember, but wait a second, I actually get a lot of joy from acting. I, I love what I do and I need to find a way to be able to do both because for a long time I was just writing books and being an activist. And, you know, I got, I was so filled up doing that, that I forgot about this other part of myself. And um, yeah, so I think, I think that's what happened. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's such a great answer. You, you had such a powerful sense of purpose, which carried you through so many years. And I can really relate to that. I mean, I wasn't involved in showbiz, but I worked in the advertising and media world and it was a baptism of fire. Um, You know, the work, the the hours, the pressure, you know, if I think I had stayed in that world, it would have crushed me because I'm a very sensitive person. Um, Like you, I love to learn and connect with people. I believe in compassion and the compassion of our species. And I think, you know, I'm in my um, early, early 40s. And I think if I hadn't made that change, I've been an activist and, and involved in this movement for the last eight or so years. It's given my life so much purpose that all the other noise is kind of like out there. And it's kind of allowed me to really give my own life a sense of purpose. That being said, like you, I have a love of media and 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 creation, you know, you with with acting in me with like physical media. And I've realized that I can still do the thing that I love whilst also trying to help animals and the planet. So, you know, finding that beautiful balance, I think, is is really important um, and a great way to sort of move forward. So um, I'm really pleased that you you found that in your life and, you know, it, uh, it inspired you to move forward. I think, what, I think that when you, when you have a perspective of what's happening in the world and it's really tragic, I think that 
you everything else just seems so silly, right? And I could still have a great time. I can go out dancing with my friends. I'm super fun. But I also am really intense about what's really going on in the world. And I think that when we know what I'm always looking for the truth in every single thing, and we are most of the time being lied to. You cannot like listen to the media. You have to dive very deep into your research about anything and everything. And I, I you know, if, because of your being vegan, I learned that a long time ago, right? The package says it's the package says the cow's happy. The cow's not happy, right? So you know, um, I think that having a sense of what's really important in this world makes everything else easier. You know, when you don't have a sense of all of what's really important in life, then if you don't get that job or that movie doesn't do well, or you're not working, that probably hurts a lot. But when you're busy trying to make this world not <laughs> fall apart and you're trying to make, you know, all the suffering end, then you're sort of like, oh, okay, well, that's, how, I'm busy. That's okay. You know, you just have more perspective about everything, I think. And I don't have a lot of tolerance for the silly things. You know, I like to have fun and be silly, but I mean, the distractions. Every time there's a distraction, I just, I, just, I don't want to, I don't even care, you know. Yeah, it's so important. And, you know, I, I, as a Buddhist, I have been Buddhist for sort of 12, 13 years. And part of our, the kind of belief system of Buddhism is to live a life of service, yes. to be that Bodhisattva and help and support others. is nothing more rewarding in this life than seeing other people thrive from the support that you give them and the encouragement and, and the guidance, um, which leads me nicely onto your podcast, The Real Heal, um, which is very exciting. Um, I was very happy to see a couple of my good friends uh, appearing on your podcast, Ali Tab Tabrizi, uh, director of Seaspiracy, and Dr. Angie Sadeghi, who's an amazing gastroenterologist, really, really knowledgeable and experienced, who is actually on the previous episode to this one. So you will be hearing her before this episode. Um, but tell us a little about this podcast because it's about healthier bodies and healthier minds and life overall. But what is the sort of the kind of central message that's going to run through your conversations that you have with others? I really, because I care about so many different things, we had to find a kind of through line that would tell a story, a sort of arc. And um, I, we we landed on healing because that is really what is at the core of everything healing. We all need to heal. We need to heal our communities. We need to heal ourselves. We need to heal our earth. And there's so much healing to be done. And so I think that I wanted to ask the questions, what is it really going to take for us to heal these things? What, you know, I'm speaking, the first episode I talked to one of my best friends, Mary Walden, and um, she's just such a dear human. I mean, one of the greatest humans. And and she's a she's a clinical therapist in Chicago, and uh, but she's my pal. I'm lucky she's just my pal, and we giggle and laugh together. And I had her on just exploring love and what it means to love ourselves and what the world needs and why we need love and really tapping into the root of it all. What is at the root of healing, and that's love. So then, Dr. Laura Morgan is all about uh, parenting and how we heal our children and we can heal ourselves through parenting and how we can heal the world and make these mini activists by being not activists who are going to go help animals necessarily, but who are going to be kind, compassionate humans who are not yelled at, who are attuned to, who are seen and therefore can very much understand why they wouldn't probably want to harm animals or the earth, but more importantly, are just at our citizens of this we want to create good citizens of this earth. And I think being a parent, you can just make another person that you think is wonderful, or you can make a person who is completely awake and conscious and present and loving and is confident in their body and feels good. So they go out and they act good. You know what I mean? So, so we talk about a lot, a lot about that. I had Kevin Smith on and he talks about his, um, how he had this big awakening because he's this really fun pop you know, iconic pop culture um, filmmaker. And he was he, very large and he, pardon me, Kevin, but that's true. And he knows that. And then he had a massive heart attack and he almost died and he changed his diet after that. And that's a really fun, interesting story. And he's just so funny. 
And I had Pinky Cole who had slutty vegan. Um, and she's you know, amazing. She is. And she's such a fun, that's such a fun conversation. And we're talking about food deserts and how to heal these food deserts. And what is at the core, I think, not only of, I think, again, back to what you said earlier about how we get sort of this unfair misinformation categorizing of vegans as, you know, me angry people is so ridiculous because the truth, or even that we don't care. I love when people say to me, they used to say, why does she only care about animals? And it's like, well, you don't care about anything. So let's just ask, like, where are we going to begin here? <laughs> um, but, you know, what are you doing for the world? While I'm out doing this, what are you doing while you're criticizing my love of animals? But anyway, what I found on this is everyone like me, all of these people are not just working for animals. They're working for many different things, you know? Um, the Pinky Cole is working to heal communities through her healing food. And she is healing these food deserts. And we talked about prison and her dad and her, you know, how she learned from him. And, and she helps kids coming out of juvie. Like, there's more to it than a vegan burger. And... And that's same with Ingrid Newkirk. I interview Ingrid Newkirk and Peter Singer, you know, who in the 70s wrote that beautiful book that's made so much change for people. Um, both of, he's an ethics, he was an ethics major when he went vegan. And so his story, he and Ingrid are both also very committed to helping humans. And I think that that gets really overlooked that you know, I'm an activist and you could call me an animal activist for sure, but I'm a life activist. I'm a activist for all humanity. I want everyone to be, to have the, I don't want things to be unfair. I want think people to have the truth. I want people to have access to the best possible life they can have. And I don't want money and corporate greed and pharmaceutical industry to and, and the media to rule our lives and distract us from ourselves and make bad decisions because they're telling us what to do. I want us to be free thinking people who can... Um, take care of ourselves and not rely on pharmaceuticals and, you know, this sort of expected way of doing things. Um, we have to use pharmaceuticals sometimes, but let's try not to, right? So that's what Dr. Uh, Angie uh, Sadeki was talking about. And um, so I have all these really great conversations with so many different people that I admire so much. And my conversation about Seaspiracy, I mean, that movie, I learned so much. I've been a vegan for 25, I don't know how many years, 20 some, 24 years now. OG vegan. <laughs> and I learned so much from that movie. And I, I did sometimes slip up on fish. You know, I would slip up. I, I've, I've always said that it's better to be, you know, 99.9% .9 vegan than, than, than not, right? Like if you're going to, if you have to slip up on something, that's okay. That's part of my book too, is encouraging people. It's not about perfection. It's really not. You're, it, the more good choices you make, the better you will feel, the earth will feel, and the animals will feel. So it's, you don't have to beat yourself up if you be perfect. A world of imperfect vegans is better than a world of no vegans at all, right? A hundred percent. And and I really like when people say I'm an aspiring vegan, right? Like I'd rather you say I'm an aspiring vegan because it really helps people to know that that's the, that's the direction you're in. And oops, if you mess up, you can get back on. It's a tricky path, isn't it, with regards to perfection? because veganism obviously is a life philosophy and it and it, it has its it has its challenges especially on the human side of things um, I have this conversation with people all the time and I have friends who are, are a mix of really hardline vegans and more temperate vegans like me and more and also pragmatic vegans as well and you do get people who say well you know if you say to people imperfection is fine are we giving people an excuse to be imperfect all the time every day and i think for me it's a balance isn't it it's about saying to people look there's no perfection in this life it's, you know human being is perfect but ultimately we know through the data and science that a whole food plant-based diet is the is the best diet for treating the leading killers of human beings we look at our most genetically close cousins on this planet 
which are the apes. Human beings are a species of great ape. We look at what they eat. They eat a diet made of predominantly whole plant foods. And you do not see the diseases in our ape cousins like you do in human beings. So what is it? <laughs> it's the food. Um, as you say, I love what you said. Pharmaceuticals have a place. I take some pharmaceutical medicine for my chronic pain, but I eat a whole food plant-based diet as much as I can. And when I'm eating lots of fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and legumes, I have great health. And when I sway from the path, <laughs> I do experience some more chronic pain and some more illness, but it's still my choice to do that. And I think ultimately we do want to just inspire people just to be better people, as you say, and just keep on moving forward on that path. But there is sometimes a lot of pressure on us, particularly as activists. You're an activist, you're an author, you're an actress. There's all these things that you do. How do you stop burning out? You've got a business, you've got, you've got this amazing My Kind Organics, which are vitamin line, which we'll talk about in a sec. But there's all these things that you're doing, managing all these different things. You've got a family. How do you avoid getting completely exhausted and burning out and going, you know what, I can't do any of this anymore? <laughs> well, I do get overwhelmed by all the things that are on my plate. The, the biggest intruder is email and text. I think the yeah. admin of life is, it's just unbelievable to me that it takes an hour and a half to get through a day's texts. And that just feels wrong. You know, it feels insult. It feels like a violation <laughs> to my life. I don't want to spend an hour and a half of my life every single day doing texts. So I get very behind on them, but then I have to catch up to them. So it's a just, it's a, it's an unfortunate part of our admin of life, right? And the emails and the emails. So, but that's how we get our things done. And so, yes, I do get overwhelmed by that. And I think, but I, I always am able to regroup. I always go back to, if I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm, I need to sleep more. I need to make sure I'm eating as well as I possibly can. I need to, um, so that's when I turn to my superhero diet and the kind diet. And I make sure that I try to go to bed earlier and I get, I just stop everything and prioritize. And I have a sort of master priority list of sort of what it is. And sometimes I've had to really force myself to put myself on that priority list because you can get so busy trying to take care of everything else. And you forget that you're without the foundation, you're useless. So I have learned to put myself on that list. And by doing that, I'm able to be a great mom, a patient mom. And uh, so I, I, it's constant re recalibrating, right? Like going, okay, um, I obviously didn't sleep enough last night. So tonight that I'm going to make sure that I turn everything off at nine and I, and, and, um, and get to bed, you know, <laughs> and like take a bath or something, you know, the, the things that you can do, and sometimes there's no time for that. There hasn't been time for that for a week. And so then you go, well, this is, I have to do this or I'm going to, I'm going to lose. I'm going to fall apart. I have to be in Michigan this weekend. How are you going to get on the airplane? You got to pack. Like there's all these things you have to do. So it's this sort of uh, constantly moving things off the plate is really what I'm doing. Like I can't deal with this right now. Can't the deal power with of saying no. <laughs> the power of no. And, and sometimes it's no for today. And then, and then I can readdress it later. And, um, because that's I know the power of no is a good thing, but a lot of the, the a lot of the things are things that are self inflicted because they're things that I want to do. I mean, honestly, I want I have two more books in me that I've got to get out. My my vitamins I've got all I love making my kind organics. The they are they were the first ever certified organic non GMO verified all food based no fillers no binders just clean food in a in a bottle, and. Um, and so I'm very proud of that. And I want to work on that. And I've got my website and my activism and my, you know, it's endless, the things that I want to do. It's not like it's, it's not, not like enough time in one life, right? Not enough <laughs> time in one life. And so it's about, like, constantly going, well, what is the best use of this time? You know, how can I be, and I do, Prioritization, pour, right? I pour a lot into my child and that feels like a very important thing to be doing. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's priority. I'm sure you get you get this question a lot. Do you think Cher, uh, your character in Clueless, would be vegan if she was a real person? I mean, I think that she really changes towards the end of the film, and she understands how to make choices that help other people and wants to be good. And since um, Josh, her stepbrother slash boyfriend, um, <laughs> uh, since, since he cares about the environment between them 
if it, if it, if it came to their attention properly, that actually, if you care about the environment, you must be vegan and that she, I think she would, I think for sure she would. Amazing. Before I let you go, uh, I always like to ask my guests this one final question. If you were stuck on a desert island and it was just you and a pig, um, if you've listened to this podcast, you know what's coming next. Obviously, Alicia, you're not going to eat the pig because you're a vegan. Um, but if I could give you one vegan dish, one music album and one book, what would you take with you? Oh. Oh. I guess Shantaram, the book. Amazing. And um, a dish, mean? all I need, I mean, it wouldn't make me survive, so it wouldn't be a good idea, but it would just <laughs> be my favorite, most delicious thing, which is sourdough toast with Miyoko's butter and tomatoes, like heirloom tomatoes and a little salt on top. I could eat that forever. What would your music be? Oh, I mean, that's hard to have to pick one. I'd get real bored of it. But I do love um, Ray LaMontagne and uh, Paolo Nutini. And uh, yeah, so I don't know, one of those guys. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the PBM podcast, Alicia. What a pleasure to hear a bit of your story and uh, hope we can do an episode two at some point in the future. Thank you so much. It was lovely to talk to you and thank you for what you're doing and bringing into the world. I can tell that you are a very passionate man who's making a lot of good. So thank you.